Amen. He's worthy of our glory, and it's exciting to come and be able to share with him. So we greet you this morning in Jesus' name. As was mentioned before here this morning, we're going to look at walking in him this morning. We're going to be using Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Three points here we're going to look at, and that's number one, we're, we're focusing on God and how that he has called us to walk with him. Number two, we're looking at how that Jesus has has, uh, has come and given himself so that we can please God through Christ. And number three, we're looking at how the Spirit of God comes and he dwells us so that we can be empowered by him as individuals that are no longer enslaved to sin, but we are open and free to walk led by the Spirit of God. So that's, that's the plan of our outline here this morning. Walking in Him, point number one, verses one through six, we see how that God has called us unto Himself. And uh, let's remember here, the book of Ephesians is written to people that physically have very little. The people at Ephesus, they tell me, were poor. And so they had this concept because they lived barely getting by with, with the necessities of life. They had a hard time grasping the reality of the riches of God through Jesus Christ. And so they had this concept of poor, beggarly elements of the world hemming them in and keeping them controlled by the necessity that they experience in life. And so as Paul is writing here, he's trying to show them the riches that they have through Jesus Christ, the riches that they have, and the glory that they have coming to them because they are adopted into the family of God. So he starts his focus in chapter 1 by looking at how that God has chosen them and because God has chosen them and they are adopted into the family of God, they no longer have to live and work and operate as though they are poor, as though they are peasants, as, as though they were enslaved to the surroundings that they find themselves in. All right? So we see this, and, and Paul is writing, and he's saying, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to hold you back, but in the glory of God, I want you to go forth. The second thing I want to bring to our attention, and that is, we see Paul here in the first verse, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And I love that, because Paul never introduces himself as Saul of Tarsus that was the persecutor. He doesn't introduce himself as the one who went about enslaving people into prison. He doesn't write about who he used to be. He doesn't brag about what he did in the past. But he comes and he says, I am Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And so Paul finds his new identity through Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what he's trying to show the, the believers here in the book of Ephesians. You now have a new identity. It's not the poor the poorness of your life, but it's the richness of God through Jesus Christ that you need to focus upon. Paul is saying, I am now an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I come to you glorifying God because of what God has done in me and what God is doing through me. And he wants them to grasp this. To you that are living in Ephesus, I want you to know that it's not the lack of what you have that identifies you. It's not the past of what you have done that identifies you, but it is your freedom through Jesus Christ, and it is the reality that God has chosen you before the foundation of the earth. It is the reality that before the foundation of the earth was laid, He knew you, and He chose you, and that you have part in that plan today, and that you can go forth in His riches, knowing that God is good that Christ is alive, and that the Spirit wants to lead us through life. This is the beauty of these first 14 verses here. We see Paul, the apostle, and who is he writing to? He's writing to the believers that are called by God to be 
saints through Jesus Christ. He's not writing to believers that are still bound in sin. He's writing to believers that are called and identified as saints because of what Jesus Christ did. It's not because of what I do. It's not because of what I know. It's not because of who I am. It's not because of the understanding that I have. But it's because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has given. It's because of what Jesus has done for you and I on the cross of Calvary that we can come to him realizing that we're not only believers, but we are saints through him. We are his saints today through Jesus Christ. We are called to that understanding of what it is to be united with him. He blesses God the Father. He says that we, we can live and we can be blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. Now it's interesting because in the book of Ephesians, I think there's five different places I think I wrote that down here. Five different places where he talks about the heavenly places. In chapter 1, he speaks of the heavenly places, verse 3 and verse 20. Chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 6 all identify and speak about the heavenly places. Let's remember, there are many earthly places that we can go and visit. Many beautiful, amazing places that we can see. Many, many phenomenons in the world. Made by man or made by God, right? They're beautiful, beautiful, um, epic, uh, beautiful places that man built and created that, that are wonderful to see, amazing to see. But let's remember that the greatest of all wonders is that you and I can dwell in heavenly places through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's important that we understand that those heavenly places are places that God is calling us to. He's calling us to unite ourselves in him. Why? Because he has chosen us in verse 4. Because we become part of his family. Because we come to be not Paul the persecutor, not me the sinner before I knew the Lord, right? But we come to this place where we are holy and without blame before him through Christ Jesus our Lord. We are holy, we are without blame before him because we have experienced his love and therefore as we walk in his love although we are we have a nature that can sin and a nature that is bent to turn away from god yet in his love and in his understanding we stand blameless before him why because of the sacrifice of jesus christ on the cross of Calvary. we just went through the beautiful time of easter Beloved, let us never get over, let us never get over the excitement of Easter. Why? Because the tomb is empty. Because Jesus Christ, who was crucified and buried, rose from the dead on that third day. And he said, I come to infill you with my spirit. I go. I'm going back to my Father. And as I go back to my Father, I will promise you a surety that I will send my spirit. And when the Spirit of God was poured out upon those believers on the day of Pentecost, it was proof that once again the words of Jesus Christ were true and real and forever established. He said, I will go to my Father, and as I go to my Father, I will send my Spirit to you. Once again, he proved that the words of Christ were true. Why? Because he sent that Spirit, proving that he returned safely to his Father. He said, I want you to understand that to be united with me brings grace to your life that the human experience doesn't understand. Secondly, he said, I want, to, I want you to understand that to be united with me brings you to a place where you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Thirdly, he said, I want you to be united with myself. Why? So that you can understand my mercy and therefore extend my mercy to those around you. He said, my love, my grace, my peace, my mercy needs to be shared with the world. The unbelievers need to see this. And so as you come to me and as you become united in my family, as you're adopted into my family, I want you to take those attributes that I have that you don't have without me, that the world doesn't know in completion, that the world doesn't understand. I want you to take those attributes and I want you to share them with the world. 
And so it is imperative that we understand that we're chosen by God, not as beggars, not as sinners, not as those that are steeped in sin or controlled by a nature that is ungodly or sensual or evil, but that you are united with me and therefore you have a nature that is created to glorify me. Why? Because you are now created through Jesus Christ as a new person, as a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You are united with me, and therefore, I want you to take my attributes to the world to show them not who you are, but who you've become through me, who I am. And as I live my life through you, I want you to be able and ready and prepared to share that hope that is within you. So that as the world looks on and they question they will understand who I am through you. Amen? Amen. It's important that we understand that. Our association is no longer Paul the persecutor, but now our association is with Jesus Christ. It is with him, and that brings us to that point, that now we stand before him, not as a sinner, but we stand before him fully, perfect in him, without blame. You ever struggle with that? Ever struggle with that? The idea that the accuser comes, right? The enemy comes. He is the accuser of the brethren, beloved. Don't forget that. And when you come to that point and you say, you know what? Am I really forgiven? Has God really forgiven me? Am I really saved? Some people struggle with this a lot. Beloved. Beloved, that's the accuser trying to steal your joy and your peace and your security. As you come and, and you can say to the accuser, I am in him. He is in me. I am safe in him. Why? Because he has saved me. He has redeemed me with his outstretched arm. He has seen me. The exciting thing. I have an uncle, uh, my, my father's brother. And uh, growing up, he was, uh, we were never with him a whole lot. But he's so strong, right? And it's amazed because you know, I, I was a teenager. And he'd come up behind me and he caught me with his big hands and just picked me right up off the ground and walked as though I wasn't even in his arm. He was strong, but you know what? You know what? As I see him aging, I see his strength beginning to fail. You know why I'm saying this? Because God's outstretched everlasting arm is never short. It's never weak. It will never weaken with age or with time. It won't change. It hasn't changed. It isn't changing. Why? Because God is an unchanging God who says, I want to redeem you. I have chosen you. You are mine. I am yours. You're part of my family. I've called you unto myself. And I want to secure this. And that's what it's talking. Get way ahead of myself, right? That's what it's talking about when it talks about that earnest in verse 14. That security of your salvation. It's there in that that inheritance it is signed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it is revealed by the open tomb. It is revealed as those angels sat there at that tomb. They said, he isn't here. He has risen, as he said. He has gone forth. Go into Galilee. Go into Jerusalem. You will find him, or he will find you, right? You will see him there. Take him at his promise. Believe in his word. Don't give it up. Why? Because he wants to go before you. He wants to walk that way before you to show you that there is a way. That that way is a way of victory. That that way is a way of, of, of understanding that I will walk before you and you can walk in me and you can be perfect and you can be holy and you can be without blame. So as that accuser comes and says, Ah, you did this or you did that, and therefore you are this kind of a sinner. You know what? No, I am. I am not that anymore. That might be who I was in my past, but that's not who I am now. Now I am the son of the son of God, the daughter of God, I'm the child of God. I am his. I belong to him. And we can rebuke the accuser as he comes to us, and we need to. And we love it beyond that. You need to be able to help that, that believer that's struggling with this. Go beside them. Lindsay has a cousin that struggles with this. Why? Because they need that security. And it's just nice to be able to go beside that cousin and say, guess what? Guess what? Don't worry about that. Because that's not who you are. That's the accuser coming to steal your joy. That's the accuser 
coming to show you that without him you are unholy. Amen. I am. But I need him. And that's why we need him so desperately. Because he calls us to that a holy life that is without blame. That holy life that is perfect. And it can only be holy. And it can only be perfect as we are in him. And as he is in us. And that love of God will be shed abroad. We can't shed God's love abroad until we see it and know it and experience it and partake in it. Amen. Amen. So we need to be seeing that. We need to be focusing that on that. Not on the failures. Not on the mistakes. Not on the shortcomings. Not on yesterday. Not on the way it used to be. That's where our focus goes so many times. Why? Because that's what we know. But we need to allow God to change what we are focusing on and what we know. Why? Because he has chosen us. Number two. We need to realize that we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're not redeemed by what we know. We're not redeemed by what we can buy. Okay, these people were, were in Ephesus. They aren't redeemed from their poverty necessarily. All right, you with me? Oh, uh, yeah. Sometimes God blesses us in, in ways that, that help us. Hey, there are good things in the Word of God that help us. But God doesn't necessarily take these people at Ephesus out of their poverty. And Paul doesn't take them out of that poverty. But he tries to show them that that poverty dare not control their spiritual walk with God. That poverty dare not give them an identity as a poor beggar in Jesus Christ. But that a chosen child of God, redeemed by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ... Called to be saints, not called to be beggars, but called to be saints in him. Called to be those that understand that we have received the grace of God and that it is a favor undeserved and unmerited. It's not something I can work for. It's not something I deserve. But it is given to me by God's graciousness and given to me through Jesus Christ. So we have that grace that comes to us. Secondly, we have the redemption that comes to us through the blood of Jesus Christ and no other way, beloved. It is only through the blood of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. There is no second plan. There is no other way of coming to God save through Jesus Christ and the shed blood on the cross of Calvary. All we can say is praise Him, praise His name, thank you God, because He has come and he said, I want to redeem you. You know, Christ came. He didn't die for me because I was good. He died for me because I was a sinner. Amen. Amen. He died for me because I needed that. He redeemed me. And while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Paul comes and he says, you know, there are different times when Paul gives not only uh, who he is in Christ Jesus, but there are different times when he goes back and says, this is who I was. And this is what God saved me from. But every time he does that, his focus is never on who he used to be. But his focus is on where Jesus Christ brought him and what Jesus Christ has made him to be. What Jesus Christ has made him into. Christ has brought me to this place where I'm part of his family. I've been adopted. I was once outside. He said, yeah, even though he grew up with all that, that great, may I say, pedigree of Judaism. Yet, yet, he realized that he counted that all but waste so that he might gain Christ Jesus. So we see that redemption that comes through Jesus and through him alone. Why? That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together all in one through Christ, both in the heavens and that which is in the earth, even in him. You see, he wants to draw us not only to him, but he wants to draw us together through him. That we might obtain that inheritance. What is an inheritance? It's something that comes to us through someone else. Amen. It comes to us from someone. It is gifted to us. And we see this inheritance that comes and it comes through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why? Because he came that he might redeem us to himself and make us part of God's holy family. 
that we should bring praise and glory to God. All right, now, now I'm going back to First Peter, all right? <laughs> First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as we know that we are not redeemed by the corruptible things as silver and gold, we're not redeemed by our vain conversation, we're not redeemed by the traditions of our fathers, but we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb that was out without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him a glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. You see what this is doing? This is bringing us to the place where our faith and our hope draws our minds right back to our Heavenly Father in spite of whatever we're going through. In spite of the hardship, in spite of the suffering, in spite of the poverty, to those of you in Ephesus, in spite of the hardship, whatever that hardship is, it draws our hope and it draws our minds and it brings our, our hope to God. It brings us to that place where our hope and our understanding is no longer based in this world because when it is based in this world, it brings us to the place of being depressed and desperate and anxious, amen? Because the things in this world are so fleeting and so vain. They're so empty. They're so hollow. And so we come to the place where we realize that our inheritance is literally out of this world, right? We have an eternal inheritance, and that eternal inheritance does not fade away. And we have that proof through the life of Jesus Christ, and we have that hope through the resurrection of Christ and the fact that the grave was empty. Christ says, I bring this hope to you, and I will assure you of this hope when I rise from the dead. Number three, we see that walking in him brings us to the place where we now are filled with his spirit. Beloved, without being filled with his spirit, all else is empty, hollow, and vain. Why? Because everything else is carnal, earthly, and fleeting. Verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of the Lord, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye have believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise and glory of God. Again, I bring this to our attention. The idea of the praise and the glory of God needs to bring us to the idea that our redemption was not brought to us. We sing that song with the children sometimes about this little light of mine. You don't hide it under a bushel. You don't hide it under a basket. You don't hide it in the world. Because, beloved, if you hide your truth, if you hide God's truth, it is only hidden from the unbeliever. Amen? You aren't going to hide it from the other believers. So that as you, as you shine your light forth, as you shine God's love and God's light forth, you are shining it to the lost around. It's an encouragement to the believer. Yes, it is. Needs to be. Should be. Ought to be. But it needs to, of necessity, be shared so that the world can see. So that the unbeliever can see. So that those who do not know him can see. And, and, may I say, ask questions. See, those questions shouldn't be a threat to us, right? Some time ago, um, my friend uh, was telling me he was, he was a truck guy, a great big guy, and uh, he drove a truck. And one, one, he was in the middle of I don't know where, right? He didn't know anybody there. And he stopped to get something to eat or a shower or something, right? And this guy comes walking past him, a young teenager. His hat was on backwards, and he was just... No, it's on side. I don't know. It's on side. And uh, he looked at him and he thought, boy. <laughs> Why is he doing that? And he said, after the guy walked past him the third time, he stopped. <laughs> and he said, sir, is it your hat or your head that's crooked? <laughs> the guy exploded. The guy exploded. Why? Because it was a threat to him. He touched something real tender in his life, right? 
And I laughed. I just laughed in the corner. So they said, do you know what? I said, you touch something that he didn't want to touch. Mm -hmm. And I said, do we react that way when someone asks us of the hope that lives within us? Unfortunately, sometimes we do, right? But we need it. It's not a threat when somebody says, why do you do this? Or why don't you do that? Or how's come? Or no, no. You see, that's the whole idea that God tells his people from, from, the, from the Old Testament time. He says, I want to give you, I want to give you visual understanding. Okay? I want you to make this tabernacle. And I want you to make this golden candlestick. And I want you to do this, this thing with the, with the altar. And I want you to, to, to do this thing with sacrifice. And I, why? Because so, so they could see. So that they could partake of something that they could kind of understand. That they could touch. It was tangible. God is a God who loves to give examples of what he means and why. All right? And so as we have the Holy Spirit within us, it needs to be that understand. This is what I do and this is why. Okay, so the children, as, as they grow, they're not at this point yet, but they'll get there, right? They're going to say, why? They're not there yet, but it won't be long. They're going to say, why? Why do you do that? Why are you doing that? What are you doing? They might say, what? But they don't say why yet, but it's coming. <laughs> why? Because they want to know. They want to understand. They want to, they, they say, I see you doing this, but why? You see, and that's what God's doing with his people. He's saying, I want you. To shed its blood the proper way, the kosher way, right? Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I want you to understand what it is to have that covering of sin. I want you to understand that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I want you to understand that someday there will be sacrifice coming to you, and you will see him, and you will understand him, and he will give his life and his blood. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? A perfect lamb without spot, without blemish. And it was John the Baptist who sees him walking down by the Jordan River. And what does he do? You know, John must have had a big mouth too, right? <laughs> he blabs out to everybody. Behold the lamb. lamb of God. Look, here he is. Here's the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham, you will find a lamb. You know what he said? Behold, God will provide himself a lamb. That's what Abraham said to his son. Was it a lamb that was caught in the thicket? No. It was a ram. That ram was not for to be given as the lamb of God. That was a ram for one individual person. It was a sacrifice for him alone. But beloved, God says, I want you to understand the Lamb of God is coming. And so John calls out and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Beloved, God is calling us today to understand that that Lamb of God has come to give us our forgiveness and our cleansing and our new life. Also wants to give us direction and peace. He wants to give us the understanding that as we are filled with him and led by his spirit, we will understand what it is to be fulfilled in him. We've been called. We've been chosen by God. We've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And now here we are at this point where we realize that it's not until we are filled with his spirit that we understand what it is to walk in that newness of life. Not because of something that I can buy. Isn't it nice when you go to the store and you can buy what you need? <laughs> you ever go to the store? We went to the store the other day. I had forgotten how old. <laughs> Lindsay had a whole handful of stuff. And what did we have to do? We had to let there, let the money. I had no way of paying for it. It was a very humiliating feeling. It was okay. What? Because I could come back tomorrow and get it anyway, right? Or I could have turned around and gone right back today and gotten it, right? That God says, I want you to know what it is to be filled with me. And you'll never have that need that you can fulfill. It's a need that only God can fulfill. And as he fulfills that need, it is for his glory. It is for his honor. And he wants.
us to meet you tonight. Beloved, as you're walking this walk, as we walk it together, may we remember that this walk is a walk of God in your life, through your life, by the example of his Son, the Lord Jesus, and by the infilling of his Spirit. Let's bow our heads for word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you that you are so good. We thank you for the the way that you work in us and through us to your glory. Heavenly Father, we desire to, to uh, have you direct our lives and to be filled with your spirit of Lord that we may bring honor and glory to you. Heavenly Father, as, as we go through our days on this earth, we pray that we would always be prepared to give an answer of the hope you have given to us. But Heavenly Father, we ask you to make this hope real to each of us. Father, give us a glimpse of what it was like to see the empty tomb. Give us an understanding of what it is to be filled with your spirit. Thank you for the adoption that you have granted to us, Lord, that we can be part of your family. We're no longer outcasts. We're no longer strangers. We're no longer on the outside. But we thank you that you have called us, you have redeemed us, and you desire to lead us today. Grant us grace, grant us strength for the journey. And as we go from, from today, Lord, may we always be assured that your salvation is real and true and eternal. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to... Uh, We'd like to sing, sing together song number 122 this morning. Glorious is thy name. Do you know how glorious God's name is? Song number 122. Glorious is thy name. Thank you. 